Hello, human biology students, and welcome back to Biology 100. Today, we're going to have the first of two lectures on the reproductive system. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the anatomy and function of the male reproductive system, and also the process of gametogenesis, or production of sperm and eggs. Okay, before we start off, we need to talk about sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction here is defined as the production of offspring by fusion of gametes. And again, the gametes here are the egg and the sperm. So these gametes are haploid sex cells. They're haploid, meaning they have half the number of chromosomes of a normal human body cell. So a normal human body cell has 23 pairs, or 46 total chromosomes, whereas a sperm or an egg just has 23 chromosomes, and that's it. And so these gametes are made in the gonads, and the gonads consist of the ovaries and females and the testes of males. Okay, so I've been teaching human anatomy and veterinary anatomy and human biology for over 15 years now, and the sex lecture is definitely one that perks people's ears up, right? Everybody's interested in sex. And so I always start my students off on asking, uh, why do people have sex? And these are the various answers I've gotten over the years. Uh, some people say to perpetuate the species. And that's true, right? The species, Homo sapiens, would definitely die out if we didn't have sex. So that's absolutely true. Some people say to pass on the genes. That's true as well. In an evolutionary sense, the individuals that pass their genes on to uh, more generations or to more offspring uh, are sort of winning at the evolutionary game. So that answer is correct as well. Now, some people say, we have sex to make babies. That's also true, right? Can't have a baby without somebody having sex. And another answer is to allow for greater genetic variation. This answer is absolutely true. Uh, the fact is, not all living things have sex. There are some things that basically give rise to offspring through something called parthenogenesis, and that offspring is genetically the same as they are. But we think that things that have sex and combine the genes of a male and a female uh, are more resilient to environmental changes, and that's why sex has evolved. And then a last answer I've gotten here is, we have sex because it feels good. Now, is that true? Yeah, absolutely. We do have sex because it feels good. And why does it feel good? Well, evolution has selected for it to feel good so that we'll do it, so that we will perpetuate the species, so that we will pass on our genes because we want babies, etc. So all these ultimate reasons uh, come down to this proximate reason as well. So humans have sex because it feels good. So contrary to what you might think, uh, humans aren't the only species that might like sex. For example, if you go out and see two dogs doing it in the street, uh, is the one dog sitting there going, must pass on my genes? No, they're doing it because it feels good, there's an evolutionary drive, but there's some proximate reason they're doing it. They must be getting some kind of pleasure out of it. If you think that human sex can be raunchy and risque, wait until you take a look at some primates. I was fortunate enough to take a primatology class in college and I got to observe uh, different types of primates uh, in captivity and also sort of in the wild. And let me tell you that primates really like the sex. So these are some Japanese macaques here and you can see they're going at it even though the female has her little child right there. So these are dirty, dirty little monkeys. Uh, and these are bonobos. So bonobos wrote the Kama Sutra here on sexual positions in primates. They have over 40 different sexual positions. And in primates, just as in humans, we see homosexuality, we see masturbation, we see all sorts of different things. So the important point is these are not uniquely human behaviors. All right, so we're going to take a break from the sexy sex stuff for right now to talk about the bare bones of sex. And first we need to talk about the process of meiosis. But before we do that, we need to talk about mitosis. And we've talked about this before. Mitosis was a type of cell division that resulted in production of two genetically identical uh, daughter cells. So we have one cell up here that's the sort of mother cell. It divides through the process of mitosis, and then we get two cells out of that. And these cells have the exact same genetic information, and all of them have two copies of every chromosome so that we say that they are diploid. So this happens when we grow new skin cells or we repair a wound or anything like that. So the majority of cell division happening in the body is mitotic cell division. On the other hand, meiosis is a type of cell division that leads to the formation of genetically distinct haploid daughter cells. And so the important thing is genetically distinct. Here we have one spermatogonium down here that's undergoing two sets of division to become four uh, spermatozoa. Now the important part about these spermatozoa is they have half the number of chromosomes that the parent cell did, and each one of these spermatozoa is genetically distinct. Okay? Okay, so once we have those gamete formation, we then can have fertilization taking place. And fertilization is the fusion of a haploid egg with a haploid sperm. And the result here is we get something called a zygote. Now a zygote is diploid. Di meaning it has two copies of every chromosome. So if a sperm had 23 chromosomes and an egg had 23, this zygote here would have 46 chromosomes. 
23 from the mom and 23 from the dad. Now eventually this zygote or fertilized egg will start to divide mitotically to produce the neonate or the offspring which we have right here. And all that cell division is going to be through mitosis and, and that's going to give us cells that are genetically identical to one another. Okay, so while we're on the topic of the gametes, take a look at this egg and sperm here. Notice anything different? Well, you might say that the sperm is long, has a whip-like tail, a little bitty head, and the egg seem to be quite a bit larger here, right? If we drew this whole egg, it would take up the majority of the screen. And this is introducing a phenomenon called anisogamy. So anisogamy means that we have one gamete that's a lot larger than the other. In this case, the egg is much larger than the spermatozoa. And this indicates that females in this species, us, have a lot more invested in this single fertilization than males do. And this is not just the size of the gametes, but what happens after this. So think about human females. They produce one egg or ovulate one egg or oocyte per month, whereas males are producing millions of sperm per day, so they're relatively cheap. If that one female egg gets fertilized in this case, that female is going to have to gestate that offspring for nine months and then breastfeed it for a year to two years or so, and then take care of it until it's able to take care of itself, hopefully with some paternal care as well. So the point is that the female human, as well as females of other species, have potentially a lot more invested in the single gamete than males do. As a result, females of human species and other species as well are oftentimes the choose your sex. They're the ones that decide who they're gonna mate with. And because females are the choose your sex for humans as well as other species, males of these species have evolved secondary sex characteristics as well as courtship displays in order to entice females to mate with them. So for example, let's look at a peacock here. Take a look at this coloration. Now you can see these big feathers up here. These feathers do nothing for flight. They don't enable them to fly at all. They're a flightless bird. They're very annoying. They have these big eyes on them. Maybe they can ward away a predator, but that's not why it's really there. We think this display is there to attract females and it's basically a way to be like, hey ladies, hey ladies. So peacocks aren't the only birds that use ornate displays to attract mates. This here is a bower bird and the male bower bird constructs this little sort of archway here using thistle or something like that. And then it uses uh, little bits of things that it finds in its environment to basically serve as flashy come here symbols to the female. In this case, this bower bird, you can see, uh, collected a lot of bottle caps and what looked like a lot of plastic blue swizzle sticks. So hopefully that female is really into that. Now, not only do we see this in birds, but we also see it in other species as well. For example, this is a species of pufferfish where the male will spend weeks and weeks and weeks creating this very ornate sand nest in hopes the female will come mate with him. Let's hope she does. And then, of course, we have to go back to birds again. So this is the bird of paradise, the male bird of paradise, and the female bird of paradise. And the male bird of paradise, when it's a mating season, will hold out of its feathers and kind of do this thing and be like, hey, look at me, look at me. And you can see she's very nonplus, sort of deciding whether it's worth her time or not. So there's a lot of courtship displays that go on in birds, in fish, and a lot of other vertebrate species where the male is trying to attract the female because remember, in general, the female tends to be the choose your sex. So here's a question for you. Given all this, do you think humans also use secondary sex characteristics and courtship displays to attract females? The answer is absolutely they do. Think about males who go to the gym to build up their muscle mass. Now just by being males, we have testosterone, which helps us to build muscle anyway, but the fact that we go to the gym and work out, uh, sometimes that can be for our own benefit, but also right to attract mates. When you're in high school, think about the guys in your class. Did they work out a lot? Probably so, or they surfed or something like that, tried to stay active and look good for females. Facial hair is also a secondary sex characteristic in males. It used to be really popular back in the 1900s, and now it's coming back, unfortunately. Okay. And then we have, of course, tattoos. Now, tattoos are a way to basically put a signal on your body. They look cool, right? If you go to the beach here, about probably 40 or 50% or more of males have tattoos on there. And then, of course, you have the trifecta here, Jason Momoma, who has not only the muscles, the facial hair, but also the tattoos. So it's all three things in one, and this is definitely appealing uh, to members of the opposite sex. Okay, so body hair and tattoos and big muscles aren't the only characteristics that guys use to attract girls. In my area of the country, if you wanted to attract a mate, you would potentially get a truck that looked like this, right? So think about the guys in your high school and whether they had souped-up cars or something like that or a souped-up truck that's jacked up. A lot of that is because you enjoy it yourself or you're competing maybe with other males, but a certain degree it can be looked at as a sort of courtship uh, display uh, in order to attract females. Not sure how effective it's going to be in this case. 
All right, now that we've talked about anisogamy and its effects on female mate choice, we're going to go back and talk about the anatomy and function of the male reproductive system. So the male reproductive system has four major functions. One, we have to produce gametes, and the gametes here, again, are the spermatozoa. We also have to produce seminal fluid, and the seminal fluid here will be used to nurture our sperm as they travel through the female reproductive tract. We also have to get the sperm to where they need to be. In this case, we have to do intromission, inserting the penis into the vagina, and ejaculation. And of course, we also have to make hormones. The male reproductive system makes its chief hormone, which is testosterone, which stimulates spermatogenesis, but also male secondary sex characteristics. All right, let's take a look at the components of the male reproductive system. We have the testes down here, which are the male gonads, and they're sitting in the scrotum, which we'll talk about its function. We have a duct system that helps to get those spermatozoa into the urethra, and we also have accessory sex glands that make secretions that become part of the seminal fluid. And of course, we have the penis right here, which is the organ of intromission that's inserted into the female vagina. Okay, first we're going to talk about the scrotum. So a scrotum is the outpouching of skin that holds the testes. Now the testes are hanging outside the body, and that's pretty weird. The female gonads are hanging inside the body. They're suspended deep inside the abdomen where they're well protected. Whereas the testes are out here where anybody could just like kick them or something. So the reason the testes are outside the body is that sperm production works best at around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, in contrast, human body temperature is around 98.6, and so the scrotum allows the testes to hang lower than the body and cool off so that we can have efficient sperm production. We do have muscles in the scrotum that can adjust or elevate uh, the testes in times when it's cold, or they can let them hang lower in times when it's really warm. All right, now we're going to talk about the male gonads or testes. Now, testis is singular, testes are plural, but there's no testicle. Testicle is not a word in this class, so we're either going to say testis or testes. So a testis is the site of sperm production, which is called spermatogenesis. It's also the site where we make testosterone, right here in the testis. Now, surrounding the testis is something called the epididymis. The epididymis is a site where the sperm mature until they're ready to be ejaculated. Okay, and the last tube here is something called the vas deferens or ductus deferens. And the purpose of this tube is to transmit the spermatozoa from the epididymis uh, up to the urethra during ejaculation. Okay, while we're on the subject of vas deferens, we need to talk about a procedure called a vasectomy. So vasectomy is a cutting of the vas deferens. And the reason we would do this is as a form of birth control. Let's say you've had two kids, you don't want to have any more, and you don't want to use condoms and stuff like that because you forget birth control pills, your wife get, forgets. And so a good tried and true method of birth control is something called a vasectomy, where we actually sever just the vas deferens and tie it off and ligate that. So it's unlikely that spermatozoa will be able to go from here up to here, and it has over a 95% effect in this rating. Okay, now we're looking at a sagittal section of the testis, and what you can see here is divided up into different compartments by these two tunics, the tunica vaginalis and tunica albuginea. Now you don't need to know these tunics for this class, but you do need to know the term in yellow here. So the functional unit of a testis is something called the seminiferous tubules, and this is where the spermatogenesis takes place. Okay, so what we can see here is we have a cross-section or transverse section of a seminiferous tubule, and on the outside of the tubule we have cells called spermatogonia, and these cells divide mitotically to become spermatocytes, There's sper the spermatocytes then divide to become secondary spermatocytes, and eventually we have spermatids and eventually spermatozoa. So here within the lumen of the tubule you can actually see the tails of the spermatozoa. So the big picture here is that the functional unit of the testis are the seminiferous tubules, but in between these tubules are some very important cells I should point out. These are likely going to be our lighting cells. These are the cells that produce testosterone under the direction of LH from the anterior pituitary. All right, the process of spermatogenesis is by and large a meiotic type of cell division. So we have one cell that divides meiotically to make four different cells, and these cells are genetically distinct and also have half the number of chromosomes from the parent cell. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy of the male gametes, or spermatozoa. So obviously these gametes are carrying the male's genetic information to become part of the zygote. Now if we look at, at the head of the sperm, this is where that genetic information is. This is where the nucleus is. And then the nucleus up front is covered by something called the acrosome. The acrosome is a capsule that contains hydrolytic enzymes that will help to digest their way through the female egg, or the outside of the egg, which is called the zona pellucida. Now behind that we have a midpiece in here that has lots of mitochondria, right, because this cell is generating a lot of flagellar movement here with our flagellum, so we have a lot of mitochondria there, and those mitochondria are extracting energy from the seminal fluid. Now think about sperm, we're not just producing one a month like females are producing one egg a month, males are in fact producing around 400 million sperm per day. 400 million sperm per day. 
So the next time you look at your dad or your boyfriend or your brother and they're just sitting on the couch looking like a log, remember that they are working hard producing up to 400 million sperm a day. Okay, now we're going to talk about hormonal regulation of the testis. We said before in a previous lecture that the endocrine system is run by the hypothalamus, which is part of our brain, and the hypothalamus helps to run the anterior and posterior pituitary. So we're going to talk about how that works. So first of all here we have our testis, which is our target organ, and that target organ is going to be controlled by our anterior pituitary. So first of all, our hypothalamus is going to secrete the hormone GNRH, and that stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. So GNRH travels to the anterior pituitary where it stimulates the production and release of FSH and LH. Now these two hormones have an effect on the testis. LH stimulates testosterone production, and together testosterone and FSH stimulate spermatogenesis and sperm maturation. Now once we have adequate amounts of sperm in the testis, another hormone called inhibin will have a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary and reduce the amount of FSH and LH being produced. Okay, so now that we've talked about the male gonads, we're going to go back and talk about some of the accessory structures. And the accessory sex glands here help contribute to the seminal fluid, which is ejaculated during the sexual response. So the seminal vesicles are our first vesicle here. They produce the majority of the seminal fluid, and it's about 70% of the seminal fluid here, and it has fructose in there, and fructose is there to provide nutrition for the sperm as they're swimming their way up the female reproductive tract. Remember, these sperm can stay alive and be viable for up to 48 hours. So the energy that they have is coming from the seminal fluid. They don't have a lot of cellular energy reserves themselves. The other thing that's in this seminal fluid is we have lots of alkaline fluid. And the reason is the female reproductive tract is very acidic. And so it's very hostile to our little baby sperm there. So this alkaline fluid helps to neutralize that acidity so that our sperm have a greater chance of surviving. Now the prostate gland is the next gland down here. This makes a slightly acidic secretion, but it also contributes about 25% to our seminal fluid. Now between these two, we also have something called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins is basically a hormone-like compound that will stimulate smooth muscle contraction in the female reproductive tract. And this is important because it's not just the swimming motion of the sperm that get the sperm to where they need to go. Uh, actually, when the seminal fluid gets inside the female, the prostaglandins will cause a little tremor there in the smooth muscle of the vagina, the uterus, which will help bring the sperm up to the fallopian tubes by a process called reverse peristalsis. And finally, we have another gland here called the bulbourethral gland. This contributes the smallest amount to the seminal fluid, but it is still very important. Think about where sperm are ejaculated from. They go out the urethra. What also goes out the urethra? Urine. So after urine leaves the urethra, the urethra is very acidic and, again, inhospitable to our sperm. And so before we have the main ejaculation, our bulbal urethral glands will have a little bit of pre-ejaculate, which will basically wash down the tubes and neutralize any remaining acidity from previous urinations. Okay, so semen is a fluid containing sperm, but it also contains a lot of other stuff. So a normal ejaculate will be somewhere between 2 to 5 milliliters, and each ejaculate will contain somewhere between 20 and 150 million sperm per milliliter. Now again, I said the seminal fluid was slightly alkaline, and that alkalinity is to neutralize the acids from the female reproductive tract, and it also contains prostaglandins to stimulate smooth muscle contraction, as well as fructose to provide energy for the sperm. Okay, while we're on the subject of the prostate, let's talk about some prostate disorders. Prostatitis is a very simple uh, infection there with bacteria which causes inflammation. And then we have something called BPH or benign prostate hyperplasia. As a man gets older, uh, hormones cause the prostate to enlarge. And because the prostate surrounds the urethra, it can impinge on the urethra and make it difficult to urinate. So sometimes a guy will need surgery in order to enlarge this hole where they'll put a balloon catheter up there or something like that. And then there's prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is actually a very dangerous cancer and the second most common cause of cancer death in males in the U.S. So if you are like 50% of the population, a male, and owning a prostate, what should you do? Well, you should go to your doctor after 40 and then get your prostate examined. So prostate examination is often a digital exam, and I know this seems very low tech, but what they're doing in there is palpating the size and regularity for the prostate. So doing this, they can identify any asymmetries, which might potentially be cancers, and then they can biopsy that. They can also do a PSA test, which looks for a prostate-specific antigen. And PSA numbers can be higher with cancer, but there's other things that can make PSA high as well. So overall, the best method for having your prostate checked out is to go to your doctor and have that digital exam. Okay, now we're going to talk about the penis. So the penis is the organ of intromission. And what I mean here by intromission is inserting the penis into the vagina so that we can ejaculate. 
So why do men have a penis? Not all vertebrates have a penis, and a lot of things go fine without a penis. Well, what a penis does, it allows us to produce less sperm and get that sperm closer to where they need to be. Let's look at fish. Most fish don't have penises, so let's take a look at some fish testes. So this is a fish, it's been cut open, and what you can see here is its testis is proportionally very, very big. If you were a guy and had a testis the size of this fish's testis, they would be about the size of two loaves of French bread shoved inside your body cavity. Sounds a little uncomfortable to me. But the reason that fish have to have such large testes is because they don't have a penis. And so when fish spawn, it looks something like this. So what you can see here is a spawning aggregation of fish, and you just see this large cloud of semen. And the reason is, is that the chance that any one sperm cell will fertilize an egg cell is very, very small because the eggs have been broadcast all the way out here, and the male doesn't have a penis, and so it has to broadcast its gametes out as well. Uh, so we have to produce a large number of gametes, a large number of sperm, in order to have a probability of fertilizing the egg. All right, because a male human or a male primate has a penis, they're able to get that spermatozoa a lot closer to the female gametes or oocytes, so they don't have to produce near as many sperm as something like a fish does. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about penile anatomy. So what you can see right here is the penis is connected to the pubic bones by something called the root. And beyond that, we have the long part of the shaft of the penis, which is caused, called the body. Now the body contains erectile tissue. We actually have three bundles of erectile tissue two bundles of something called corpora cavernosa, and one bundle of corpus spongiosum. And so these are erectile tissues that become filled with blood during the male sexual response. At the end here, we have something called the glans penis, and the glans penis contains lots of nerve endings, and it is homologous to the clitoris in females, so it's a site of stimulation during sexual intercourse. All right, now we're looking at the cross-section of the penis, and what you can see here are the two large bodies of erectile tissue called our corpora cavernosa. Again, those are gonna fill with blood during a parasympathetic response. Remember, parasympathetic stood for rest or digest. So when a male is relaxed and aroused, these masses of tissue will fill with blood, making the penis erect. In contrast, the other tube of erectile tissue down here is called the corpus spongiosum, and its function is to hold open the urethra while the penis becomes erect. If we didn't have the corpus spongiosum when the penis became erect, we would likely shut off the urethra, and that would basically prevent us from ejaculating into the vagina, which sort of negates the whole point of sexual intercourse. Okay, so now that we've pointed out the erectile tissue, we're going to talk about how this response works. Again, we have to have parasympathetic nerve impulses, so the guy has to be relaxed and also has to be aroused. And this is going to cause release of something called nitric oxide. So nitric oxide here is a potent vasodilator. It causes the blood vessels in the penis to enlarge, allowing that blood to enter the erectile tissue and form the erection. So the corpora cavernosa fill with blood and pinch off the veins that drain the corpora cavernosa, which causes an erection. So the veins that would drain the erection would be right up here, the dorsal penile vein. And so that actually gets pinched off, and that basically uh, keeps the blood within the penis for a period of time. So in contrast to erection, ejaculation is caused by a sympathetic reflex. Here we have spinal nerves that signal peristaltic contractions within our seminal vesicles, which are located behind our urinary bladder. Those contractions send our seminal fluid up uh, around through our urethra and then out of the penis. And once that leaves the penis, again, it's going to be somewhere between two to five milliliters, each containing millions and millions of sperm. During this period, the bladder sphincter will also constrict, which will hopefully prevent you from urinating out your penis uh, while you're ejaculating, because that's just bad form. All right, last but not least, we're going to talk about another disorder of the male reproductive system called erectile dysfunction. Now, erectile dysfunction is inability to obtain or achieve an erection or maintain an erection for a long enough period of time in order to have sexual intercourse. And this affects some 50% of men over 40 years old. There's a lot of different causes. Uh, for example, diabetes mellitus uh, results in neuropathy in a lot of patients, which results in some nerve deafness, basically, and so they're unable to maintain an erection. Uh, arterial sclerosis is another cause. Certain drugs and alcohol also have an effect as well. So these are all different causes of erectile dysfunction. Now, up to about 20 years ago, there was very little that a man with erectile dysfunction could do, but now they have treatments like Viagra, and Viagra contains a potent vasodilator that causes release of nitric oxide that, again, dilates those blood vessels in the penis, allows that blood to move into the corpora cavernosa and form the erection. Now, since Viagra has come on the market, there's other drugs as well, and together they're about a $5 billion a year industry on erectile dysfunction drugs. All right, you've reached the end of the first part of the lecture on the reproductive system. If you have any questions, go back and review those topics in the lecture again. If you still have concerns, send me an email or a text. And next time, we'll take a look at the female reproductive system, which is a lot more complex.